The same holds true for the YouTube audience. Uh, they can put their questions in the chat box and moderators will take care of it. Uh, I welcome now Dr. Janvi Joshi, a scientist from Laboratory of Conservation of Endangered Species, Lacon CCND, to introduce our speaker, Professor Raghavindra Director today. You can't hear me? Uh, now, yes. We can now hear you. Can hear you. <clears throat> uh, Thanks, Omdatta. It's a great pleasure and honor to introduce today's speaker, Professor Gadakkar. Professor Gadakkar is a Year of Science Chair Professor at the Center for Ecological Sciences in Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He is also Honorary Professor at the Jain CSR Bangalore, Aisar Mohali, and a non-resident permanent fellow of the Institute for Advanced Study in Berlin. He is also a founder, resident, and fellow and a life member of the Indian Society for Society of Evolutionary Biologists. Gadakka sir had a, a very interesting academic journey. He obtained his PhD from molecular biology from the Indian Institute of Science, then shifted to do research in the work field of ecology and evolution. And he's been doing pioneering research in the field of animal behavior, specifically looking at the origin and evolution of cooperation in animals, especially in social insects, such as ants, bees, and wasps. I remember saying him once that when he made a shift from molecular biology to ecology, established his research program in ecology, he, he moved on to set up a center for contemporary studies at AIC. One gets to hear from some of the best practitioners in humanities on a range of topics from philosophy, sociology, economics, law, to literature, art, and music. And undoubtedly, this is one of the fantastic places on AIC campus where one can hear about natural and human sciences and one interact with one another. And CCS has played a very crucial role for many graduate students who get introduced to diverse research methodologies and make them rethink about the foundations of their own disciplines. His research work has been recognized by many international and national awards. To just name a few, he's a foreign honorary member, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, foreign the German National Science Academy. He's received Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar Prize, Birla Science Prize, Homi Baba Fellowship, Pirodia Award, etc. He's also an elected fellow of various academies, including IAS, INSA, and the Third World Academy of Sciences. There are more than 250 papers and research articles to his credit. He's also published two books. One of them, Survival Strategies, which talks about behavioral ecology and sociobiology to a general audience. The other one, uh, Social Biology of Ropaldia, summarizes his research on understanding of evolution of eusociality. But apart from being an excellent scientist, one of the very important aspects of Gadakkar Sir's career to me is his dedication to teach ecology and evolution to undergrad and graduate students. Uh, you will forgive me if I cannot resist the temptation of going down the memory lane a bit. I have uh, been associated with CCMB uh, very fondly for a very long time. Uh, in fact, uh, from the time before CCMB was actually formed, um, I used to interact with uh, Dr. Pushwa Bhargava very frequently. I first met him in the late 1970s when he had organized uh, Society of Biological Chemists meeting in Hyderabad, where I was invited to give a talk. And those days I used to work in the area of molecular biology. At that time, <clears throat> CCMB was an idea in his head. Later on, I start, as Janvi said, I started working in animal behavior and he again invited me to come and give talks. And in particular, I remember I was here as a visitor for an extended period of time when the building construction was going on. The CC CCMB was still located in IACT and the building construction going on. He personally took me and showed me which lab will be where and where, which refrigerator will be kept. He had the whole picture in his mind. Who will sit where, where will be the toilet and where will be the office. On plain ground, he showed me all of these things. So it was a wonderful experience. Uh, so I, and then of course the actual inauguration of uh, CCMB with uh, late Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi was a very special event where I actually had one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction with Francis Crick, which is, you know, I owe this to Pushpa Bhargava and to CCMB. I've been coming there very often. I have been there 
many, many times uh, during the tenure of all directors, except Rakesh. I haven't come during your tenure, but I'm sure I will do that uh, very soon. So I have very, very fond association with CCP. And it's a great honor, uh, it's the highest honor you can do to invite me to give the Foundation Day lecture. Uh, I will now share my screen <clears throat> and see if I can show you my slides. Uh, can you see my first slide now? Yes. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. So as uh, Janvi said, I have called this, can we understand an insect society and why should we care? I have been working in this area now for a very long time. And what I have decided to do today is to take some glimpses, give you some glimpses of our work, not necessarily now, not necessarily earlier, but throughout this period and try to weave into a theme of whether we can actually understand. We do experiments, we get results, we interpret them, and we think we have understood what the insect society is and why insects do what they do and how it functions. Uh, sometimes I wonder if we ask the wasps, will they agree with our conclusions about what we think they do? It's not clear. So I think it's important to keep in mind that we have to make an effort to try and understand and verify our understanding in as many different ways as possible. So that's what I want to talk about. I'll begin by giving a very brief uh, introduction to what are insect societies. As I think everybody would know, uh, some species of insects organize themselves into societies. Uh, the exam best known examples are the ants, bees, wasps, and termites. They live in social groups, and I think it is legitimate to call them societies. Uh, you can compare them with human societies in many ways. And in fact, uh, they, are, they have communication, they have coordination, they have division of labor, they have conflict, they have cooperation, they have altruism, they have democracy, they have uh, autocracy. Whatever we do, they also have. And in fact, there are many things they have which we don't. So in some ways, they're even better than us. So I think we can call them societies. Uh, just to take the few examples, this is a picture of a honeybee society, a honeybee colony. As you know, honeybees live in these large uh, colonies of tens of thousands of individuals. And inside the colony, you'll find <clears throat> three kinds of bees. There is one single large female bee. She's the only one who really reproduces. Then there are, she of course produces some sons, the males are drones, who leave the colony and go and mate with queens of other colonies. So they're not really part of this colony and they do know, they don't participate in the social life of either this colony or that colony. In fact, males mate and die. Their only function is to donate sperm and they have no other function. The rest of the colony, other than the drones which leave, few hundred drones which leave and one single queen, the remaining 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 individuals are females. They are smaller in size. They are uh, physiologically sterile. They do all the work. They run the society. They build the nest. They clean the nest. They bring food. They process food. They feed the larvae. They guard the nest. They remove the dead bodies. They do everything that is really required to run the society. The queen only does two things. She lays eggs and she produces pheromones, which in in some ways guide the colony, not in a uh, top-down manner, but in a very decentralized manner. So all the real work is done by the workers. Here's a picture of the queen, which you see a relatively larger individual, which is in the, in the center. And you can see that she is surrounded by a group of workers. This is a particularly interesting behavior with honeybees. You'll always find that the queen is surrounded by a small group of workers, maybe 10, 12, 15, uh, we might say in our language that these workers are on special royal duty. They actually take care of the queen, they clean her, they lick her, they feed her, and the queen seems to have no time to do all of these things. She's very busy laying eggs, and they do all of this, and they actually move along with her, and she's looking for a place to lay her next egg. She consumes food, converts them into eggs, and she can lay literally thousands of eggs per day. And while she's doing this, the workers are really taking care of her. In addition to working at home, workers go out in search of pollen and nectar, which is their food, and bring it back to the, to the hive. And when they reach the hive, as most of you would know, they are able to communicate information of what they have found, where, how far away, to the bees at home. 
through the famous B dance language for the discovery of which Carl von Frisch got the Nobel Prize in 1973. And then naive bees, by just watching this dance, are able to go off on their own and find the same source of food. The original bee doesn't really have to guide them any further. So this is something very unique about the honeybee. Uh, one might say that the honeybee is the only other uh, animal species other than humans which has a symbolic language. There are, there are lots of communication, but uh, it's very unusual that they have a symbolic language. From an evolutionary point of view, the most interesting thing about bees, of course, is the altruism. And in bees, this altruism is to some in to an extreme. Uh, I don't know, many of you may have been stung by bees, and but you may not know that when uh, the bee stung you, yes, of course, it was painful for you, but it meant death for the bee. Every act of stinging is an act of suicide for the bee. Because when the bee inserts its sting into your body, it is unable to withdraw that sting anymore. Because the sting has bars pointing outwards and it gets lodged inside. When the bee tries to withdraw that sting, actually her abdomen ruptures. And the sting, the poison gland, and a part of her digestive system is left on your body. The bee, of course, flies away only to die within a few minutes. And this poison gland, which is now minus the owner, actually can continue to pump venom into your body. And people have measured this with the help of volunteers who are willing to get stung for the measurement, that this poison gland can continue to pump venom for about 60 seconds after the bee has flown away. And as you can imagine, this therefore is an extremely efficient venom delivery mechanism, but it means death to the owner of that sting and of that poison gland. And as evolutionary biologists, this is a paradox for us. How can natural selection favor such sacrificial behavior? After all, we think of natural selection as one of the fittest. We measure Darwinian fitness in how long they live and how many offspring they produce. Honeybee workers don't produce any offspring or almost no offspring, and they can kill themselves instantly for the welfare of the rest of the group. So that is one of the reasons why bees and other social insects are of great interest to evolutionary biologists. Ants are equally <coughs> exquisite so, uh, social insects. They maintain elaborate societies. Uh, while there are only a few species of honeybees to be studied, there are 15,000 species of ants to be studied, and they're all social. Uh, one unique thing about the ants, which I want to point out, ants do more or less everything that the bees do, except they don't dance. But the special thing about ants is that when individual bees do different tasks, they are the same bees. They are just at different ages. As the bees grow older and older, they switch from one task to the other. But the morphology and the anatomy of the bee, of course, is the same. In the ants, different subgroups of ants which perform different specific tasks actually have a different body, a different structure, a different shape, a different size. And these subgroups do different tasks. We call them castes, after human castes. And so there are morphological castes in ants, which you don't have in the bees. And because of this, also because of size difference, the individual members of the colony can be very, very different from each other. In fact, they can be so different that unless you find them together, even taxonomy is confused whether they belong to the same species or not. And the record for this intraspecies dimorphism in fact, intraspecies, intrasexual dimorphism, the record in the animal kingdom is actually held by an ant. This is a Malaysian ant. Uh, uh, a friend of mine, Mark Moffat, took this scanning electron micrograph. And this large head here is the head of the largest member of the colony. And the little one here sitting, which Mark Moffat placed on the head of the larger one, is actually the smallest member of the same colony. So it's the same species. Both are females. This bigger one weighs 500 times the weight of the smaller one. And I'm very fond of telling my molecular biology, developmental biology friends that both of these come from the same genome. So everything is epigenetics or environment. The same genome, you can either produce this large 500 times individual or this little individual, which is one by 500 of the weight of this. So there's a great deal uh, 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 of things that we can learn from social insect not only in evolution and behavior, but also in biochemistry, in molecular biology, in developmental biology, in social insects are being used in all of these areas. 
Then we have wasps, which are sort of my favorite social insect. I study wasps. Uh, the special thing I want to mention about wasps is that all social wasps, there are many solitary wasps, but all social wasps are called paper wasps. And the reason why they're called paper wasps is because they build their nest, not from wax as bees do, not from soil as termites do, not from leaves as ants do, or soil sometimes ants do, but from paper. So where do they get paper from? They manufacture paper. How do they manufacture paper? By a process that is remarkably similar to how we would manufacture paper. They scrape cellulose fibers from plants, chew it up and add their own chemicals, make a fine pulp and spread it into a thin layer and dry it. That's how we would make paper. In fact, it is paper. You can write on it. Here is a wasp nest where the entire nest is covered with a paper envelope, leaving only a small opening for the wasps to go in and out. Now, if you are brave enough to open this envelope, what you will see is the full nest, which I like to call a multi-story apartment complex. All of these are paper combs, and this is where the wasps rear their brood. Honeybees store nectar and pollen, and also they rear their young ones in the hexagonal cells of their nest. Wasps do not store food. They only rear their young ones here. And the reason why wasps do not store food is wasps are entirely carnivorous. They're entirely non-vegetarian, as we call. And unfortunately, they have not invented a refrigerator. So they have to get their food every day to feed the tens of thousands of hungry individuals in the colony. That's a, that's a very special kind of challenge. To get food and store it and process it and store it is one kind of challenge. But to be able to get fresh food every day and be unable to store is a different kind of challenge. And these are all the challenges that we can get to study and understand when we look at social insects. Now, I have spent most of my career studying one species of social wasp because I like to go deeper and deeper into a particular species. The more I understand, the more sophisticated I can ask the next question. And that's what keeps me going with one species all my career. Now, the species I've chosen is not this one. This is very difficult to study. First, as you know, it hides everything inside. You can't see very much. Also, it's very aggressive and too many individuals, they can really sting you. I've chosen a much more mild, much more beautiful wasp. This is called Ropaladia marginata. <clears throat> it's also a paper wasp. It also has a queen like honeybees and ants and other wasps. It also has workers. It also has males who don't do any work, but it's a small nest. It's a paper nest, but it's a simple, almost two dimensional nest where you can see everything. They do not have an envelope. They do not cover themselves. You can see, observe everything. In this picture, you will see, of course, the adult wasp. You will see lots of pupil cells where the cells have been closed. You will see lots of larvae in different stages of growth. And you will also see eggs in some cells. So you can see everything. You can observe everything. And it's a wonderful system to study. People often ask me, so the thing I'm asking is, can we really understand an insect society? I do not want to give you the impression that, of course, we can understand it. I don't think we should begin with that. We should wonder whether we can understand. We can do something in our language, we say something, but does that constitute understanding? And this part of a larger philosophical problem of whether we can understand nature, not just insect societies, can you understand nature as human beings? And this is a long-standing philosophical problem and we keep close at hand a statement made by the Greek philosopher Heraclitus, who said, nature loves to hide. So don't be, nature is not an open book. You just look at and understand. Nature loves to hide. So we keep this in the back of our mind. This is something we should worry about. However, we also keep another statement by another philosopher in mind. And this is the English philosopher. So this gives us caution. The other philosopher, words we keep in mind is Sir Francis Bacon, the English philosopher, who said, who gave us a window of hope. He said, nature does not unveil its secrets except under the torture of experiments. So by doing experiment, there is hope of understanding. So we derive hope from Francis Bacon, caution from Heraclitus, and keeping these two on the side, we try to tread very cautiously in between, and we try to study them, we try to understand them. Uh, in fact, at the moment, I am uh, just beginning to write a book with this title, Can We Understand an Insect Society? And I'm not going to answer the question. I'm going to describe in this book what we have done to in an attempt to understand. I'm going to let the reader decide whether we have really understood it. 
uh, <clears throat> people also often ask me, how do you study them? For many people, it's a bit of a mystery. How do you study these wars? Actually, we have developed interesting methods. It's very, very interesting to study them. First of all, we can study these wars wherever they live, or we can bring them to the lab and we can keep them. And the most interesting thing is we can mark every individual wasp with colored spots of paint, such a way that every wasp has a unique identity, a unique name, and we can mark thousands of such wasps and have their identities and have files from them on our computer where we can add information about these wasps. So this is the first advance. This helps a great deal, otherwise they all look alike. Unlike people who work with mammals and so on, we don't have body features of the animals to make unique identification. So we do this, but it works beautifully. And you can see in this picture that all of these wasps have unique color codes. We use a particular quick drying, non-toxic paint to mark on the wasp. I'm very fond of saying that this is the only item in our research which we import, because this we get from a company in the United States and they make it very carefully Make sure it's non-smelling, non-toxic, etc. because it is used for children. It's meant for children's hobby, to paint uh, models by children. And if it's good for American children, I think it's good for Indian wasps. So we import that. That's the only item of our research we import and we use here. In the lab, you can keep them open. You can just fix them, free to fly out. But you can also put them in various kinds of cages, including in little plastic boxes. You can stack these cages in large numbers in our lab. This lab is called a vespiary. This is where we grow our wasp. And some of them, we keep the doors of the cages open. My lab has no walls. It only has wire mesh on all sides. The size of the wire mesh has been so adjusted that the wasp can fly in and out, but the enemy of this wasp, the predator of this wasp, which is a bigger wasp, in fact, the one I showed you with the multi storied apartment complex, that is the predator of this wasp. And that wasp cannot come in because that's bigger. We have adjusted the size of the wire mesh that our wasp can go in and out freely, but the predator cannot come inside. But we can also keep the cages closed if we need to for some particular experiment. As I said, we can also put them in plastic boxes and line them up. And more recently, we have invented a new method where we have built very large so-called walking cages to do certain kind of experiments, which cannot be done in small cages. And the nice thing about these walk-in cages is I can not only put the wasps inside, but I can also put my student inside, where in fact the observations can be made inside these uh, walk-in cages. So coming back to the wasps, I want to emphasize that I believe that one of the problems in communicating science is that scientists are always talking only about the product of science. They're not talking about the process of science. The process is as important as the product. We must talk as much about the process of science as about the product. In fact, I would go to the extent of arguing that communicating the process is more important than communicating the product. Because the product of your particular research may be of interest only to a small number of people, but the process may be of interest to a large number of people. So we must talk about the process of science. And I will try in this lecture to tell you as much about the process as about the product. Let me tell you first how research happens in my research group. These wasps are wonderful to watch, especially if you have them individually marked, you can sit in front of them and you can watch them for hours, you won't get bored. It's much more interesting than any soap opera that you can watch on TV, any program you can watch on TV, because the wasps, as I said, do all these things. They fight, they bite each other, they feed each other, they do all kinds of interesting things and it's very interesting to watch. So primarily we watch them with our naked eyes for pleasure. Now, if they're individually marked, you begin to see some patterns in their behavior. You begin to see that they do interesting things. That raises questions in your mind and you begin to ask questions. For most of these questions, it's not at all obvious how to answer that question or even if we can ever answer that question. But every now and then a question arises where we think we could possibly answer that question if we did this or that, if we did another experiment, if we made a different kind of observation. And when we home in on such a question, then we start to design a study, design an experiment or an observational study in which we try to answer that question. And sometimes we fail, sometimes we succeed. But we think we succeed, we have an answer, we have a working answer. 
The most interesting thing is that almost invariably, when you have an answer to a question, immediately other questions arise. Questions that you did not know existed beforehand. Questions that you could not have thought of asking beforehand. And this question, answer, question, answer is how research progresses. In fact, this is so serious that even if you have answered a very important question and have a very interesting answer, there's really no time to celebrate because not only it raises another question, the validity of your answer is dependent on the answer to the next question. How can this be possible? Because there is some other question. And unless you answer that question, you are not confident about the answer to this question. And that makes research a never ending process. No time to celebrate, but plunge into the next question. So we have questions and we have answers. And there's no reason why I should not fashion this talk in terms of questions and answers. So of the many questions we have asked and a large fraction of them which we think we have answered, I will pick a few as examples to tell you how we come up with a question, how we design an experiment uh, research program to answer a question, when we think we have an answer, what we think is the answer, and how that leads to the next question. So I'll try and take you through a series of uh, questions and answers in much the same way that happens with that, except that I only pick a few, a few examples. The distinctive thing about these kinds of wasps, unlike ants, unlike honeybees, unlike even the bigger wasps I showed you, is that even though in these colonies also there is a single queen, a single reproducing individual, all the others are sterile workers, she is not different from anybody else. If you look at the picture here, I can't tell you which one is the queen. I have to wait till I see her in the act of laying eggs. Until I do that, I don't know who the queen is. So the queen looks like everybody else. In fact, she has the same morphology, even by the most sophisticated statistical morphometric analysis, you can't tell the queen apart from others morphologically. She is physiologically very similar to everybody else, at least in the beginning before she becomes a queen. So the first question we ask is therefore, is the queen different in behavior? Not different in morphology, not, appears not to be very different in physiology, is she, and we know that she's not different in her genes because uh, the same genome can give rise to a worker or a queen. So she must be different in her behavior. So the first question we asked ourselves is how does the queen behave as compared to the workers? Does she do different? Now to answer this question, what we did was, as I said, I want to tell you about the process of science. We said, what do the workers do? What do the queens do? So we observed their behavior. And we made a list of things they do using common sense, using common English language. They sit, they walk, they fly, they bite, they feed the larvae, they bring food, they process food. Whatever they do, we made long lists. And we came up with a list of about 100 things that they do. We could probably split them further, but 100 was a very good number. So we had 100 items of behavior that they do. Then we said, how many of these 100 does the queen do? And how many do the workers do? So from on this list can we distinguish queen versus worker? And so we now paid special attention to what all the queen does, what all the workers do, and to our surprise, we came up to the conclusion, there is no difference. The queen does all 100 and the workers do 99 because they don't lay eggs. So at this level, there is no difference between queens and workers. So we said, okay, so, but there could be a difference quantitatively. There is no difference qualitatively, there could be a difference quantitatively. To understand if there is a quantitative difference between the queens and the workers in the behavior, we designed two kinds of studies. In one study, we tried to measure how each wasp divides her time from day, they only are active during daytime. So from morning to evening till it becomes dark, how do they apportion their time between different behavior, between these hundred different behaviors? So we call this a time activity budget. So we constructed budgets for every wasp. How much time do you sit? How much time do you fly? How much time do you feed? How much time do you fight? So we made these budgets. And some behaviors are very short duration behaviors. So it's very difficult to measure how much time is spent on this because it may only take a few, it only takes a second to bite another wasp. So there we used a different measure. We said, how many times per hour do you do this behavior? How many times per hour do you bite another wasp? 
So we calculated frequency per hour of certain behaviors. We calculated time budget and we asked from this information, can we identify the queen? Can we tell the queen as being different from the workers? So we had large data matrix, wasps on the row headings, behaviors on the column headings, and we had, and in each cell, we had how much time does this wasp spend in this behavior? Or how many times does this wasp perform this behavior? And this kind of data, the most obvious thing to do to this data is to subject this to multivariate statistical analysis and some kind of a cluster analysis. We did that and we found to our great surprise and to our great delight, something completely unexpected, we found that this vast variation in the behavior of wasps is not a random variation. In fact, the wasps in a colony can be quite neatly clustered into three groups with much less space within the group and considerable space between groups. So there are three statistically distinct clusters. Once we got these clusters, we said, what do these wasps do? What do these wasps do? And what do these third group of wasps do? We went back to the data. And based on what they do, we named these as sitters, fighters, and foragers. The sitters seem to spend most of the time just sitting, perhaps idling, not doing anything in particular, most of the time. But there are other wasps who are very aggressive. They were the fighters. They were running around and biting and nibbling and chasing the other wasps. So we called them fighters. And then there was a third group, which was very hardworking wasps, they would frequently go out of the nest and return with food or with cellulose fibers to build the nest. So we call them the foragers. So we had these three kinds of wasps. But that didn't tell us who is the queen. In fact, the queen is not different from the workers because the queen is just one individual. And each of these groups, as you can see, has several individuals. So now we have to ask, the next question you could ask is, where is the queen? Is she a sitter? Is she a fighter? Or is she a forager? We specifically did not worry about what the queen did. We made this study for all wasps without worrying about the, who the queen is. In fact, I didn't tell my computer which one is the queen when it made this graph. So I have three groups. Now I can ask, where is the queen? Is she a sitter, a fighter, or a forager? Now, common sense suggested to us that the queen must be a fighter. Because in other such species which have been studied before, it, was, it had been shown that the queen is a very aggressive individual. She's a very active individual. She bites and nudges other individuals and makes them work and also thereby prevents them from becoming queens. So the queen rules by physical domination, by physical harassment in these other species. And therefore we said the queen must be at least one of the fighters and we don't know why she has another army of fighters with her. It turns out that she's not a fighter. In colony after colony after colony that we have studied, the queens of this species, Ropalidia marginata, are always lazy sitters. This came as a big surprise to us. Now, you can see immediately why you have no time to celebrate. You have to, uns you have to understand why. How can the queen be a lazy sitter and yet be the queen of the colony, completely respected by everybody else, not challenged by anybody else? How is it possible? So we have another question and therefore we cannot be satisfied with this answer. So every answer to every question is provisional on what the answer to the next question will be. And that's how this goes on as a continuous series. So we said, yes, the queen is, uh, in fact, we showed that the queen is a non-aggressive, non-interactive, meek and docile sitter. And therefore the question arises, if the queen is such a meek and docile sitter, how does she become a queen in the first place? Why do the other was accept her as a queen? If the queen is a bully, a strong dominant individual who will bite you with a nasty individual, it's easy to see why the other subordinate individuals will accept her as their queen. But if the queen is a meek, docile, non-interactive sitter, sitting quietly in some corner, why should they accept her? Why should they not challenge her? You can see this question is so serious that it doesn't allow you to rest. It doesn't make you satisfied with the previous answer. So you have to ask this. How do we ask this? How do we answer this question? We had already observed enough. More observations are going to give you an answer. So we had to come up with a different method of trying to answer this question. How does she become a queen? So it seemed to us that the way to answer this question is to watch her in the process of becoming, not when she's already a queen. So we wanted to know how does she become a queen. And in order to understand, see, actually watch her becoming a queen, 
we had to go to the beginning of our career as a queen. And this actually is easy to do because I already told you that the queen is like everybody else. That means anybody can become a queen. Today she is the queen, but tomorrow somebody else can be the queen. Therefore, you will remove the queen. In fact, we know that if you remove the queen, one of the workers will become the next queen. And if we remove the queen and start watching from that instant of removing the queen, then we'll actually be able to see the transition of a worker into a queen. And we can answer this question. How did she become a queen in the first place? If she is a meek, docile sitter, just sitting somewhere else. So we designed an experiment where we studied a number of colonies, where we did an experiment which lasted three days. Day one, we studied all the wasps in the normal natural colony with their queen. And here studied basically means calculate the time activity budget for every wasp, calculate the frequency per hour with which different behaviors are performed by different wasps and produce your two data matrices. So we do this over a period of eight hours from morning to evening on a particular day with everything intact. Next early morning, you take a four steps and simply hold the queen and remove her. And now you will have a queenless colony. Spend the next whole day, eight hours, redoing your study of this queenless colony and recalculate the time budgets and the frequency per hour of performance of each behavior for all the wasps except the queen on day two. Now, what did we do with the queen? We put her in a little glass vial, we gave her a drop of honey and we just kept her there. At the end of the day, we discovered that she was quite happy sitting in her glass vial and we wondered what should we do with her now that the experiment is over. So we said, well, why don't we put her back into the colony? Why deprive the colony of the queen and the queen of the colony? So let us see what will happen. And to our surprise, we found that when we put the queen back, she just went back as if nothing had happened. And neither the workers were surprised, nor the queen was surprised, everything was fine. And this gave us a unique idea that on the third day, we can repeat the entire experiment. That is repeat the measurements of time activity budget and the frequency per hour after the queen has returned to see if anything different happened. So we have now have an experiment which lasts three days. And the most surprising thing of this experiment was that as soon as you remove the queen, something extremely dramatic happened. It is so dramatic that we can know every time we see it, we can never get over it. In this colony, I already told you there are some fighters. Yes, there is some fighting going on. Fighting involves biting, nibbling, chasing individuals. We call the individual which bites or nibbles and chases as the dominant individual. The one which gets bitten, the one gets chased, one who gets nibbled, we call the subordinate individual. And so we call these as dominance subordinate interactions. So there is a low level of this kind of chasing and biting dominance and subordinate interaction that goes on in the colony, but it is fairly peaceful. Now, as soon as we remove the queen, the colony becomes extremely aggressive. It becomes hyper aggressive. In fact, the levels of dominance behavior that you see in the colony go up enormously after removing the queen. Double, four times, five-fold, six-fold, ten-fold, twenty-fold, sometimes twenty to thirty-fold increase in the aggression in the colony. So this was very dramatic. We had certainly not expected it. What was even more dramatic is that all of this new aggression that happened after we removed the queen was shown by one worker. Just one worker became extremely hyper aggressive. And we call, and then on day three, she dropped it. So this is what our data would look like. So if I plot the dominance behavior, the biting and the chasing and the nibbling on the y-axis uh, as frequency per hour, and on the x-axis, you'll see on day one, there are very low levels of dominance behavior shown by the queen and by other individuals. <coughs> On day two, this shoots up enormously. And all of this is actually one individual because the queen is no longer there. And on day three, the same aggression drops. Once the queen is returned, aggression drops. Now, what happens if you don't remove, put the queen back? If you don't put the queen back, this hyper aggressive individual will nevertheless gradually drop her aggression and will come back to almost zero in about a week eight days. But interestingly, at this time, when she is no longer aggressive, she is the next queen. In fact, she lays her first egg at about this time. So this individual who became hyper aggressive becomes the next queen. And therefore, we call her the potential queen. 
So the potential queen becomes hyper aggressive, establishes herself as a queen, and then becomes the next queen. And therefore, technically, the answer to our question is potential queens begin their careers as very aggressive individuals, and only later they become weak and docile, and that is why the workers accept them in the first place. Provisionally, this is our answer. Why does she, how does she become a queen? By actually being very aggressive. Only later on she becomes a quiet individual. But you can see this answer is not satisfactory. It's provisional because it raises the question if she's only aggressive for a week and after that she's going to be meek and docile, non-aggressive, non-interactive sitter sitting in a corner, how does she inhibit workers from reproducing? Because one of the jobs that the queen has to do is to make sure that none of the workers start reproducing. Only she should reproduce. Now, how can she do this? In other species, she does, the queen does this by actual physical aggression, physical harassment, and preventing the workers from developing their ovaries. How can it be possible? How can this happen? So in order to answer this question, we designed a different study. The old study will not help us answer this question. We designed a very different study here. And here, we first proposed a hypothesis. We know that in ants and bees, and the bigger wasps, the more evolved wasps, the queen is not controlling the worker reproduction by aggression. Only in these kinds of small colonies, this was known. In the bigger colonies, in the more evolved societies, we already know that the queens inhibit worker reproduction or regulate worker reproduction by pheromones, by actually producing chemicals. So we said, ours is a small species. It's so-called primitively used social species. It has small colonies. The queen is like everybody else. Nevertheless, who knows? Maybe our queen actually produces a queen pheromone and that pheromone actually suppresses reproduction by the workers and therefore she doesn't have to run around biting and chasing everybody else. Now, in order to test this hypothesis, we conducted a very different experiment with a very different design. We, now we brought these wasps and put them inside a closed cage. And what we did was on the first day, we put them in a cage and we studied all the wasps. And again, studied means we got these data matrices for all the wasps. Now, what we did on day two was we removed the nest and the wasps from the cage and we insert at a wire mesh screen in the middle of the cage. Now, the, wire, the purpose of the wire mesh screen was to prevent wasps from going one from one side to the other, but allow any volatile chemicals to go through. After we made this partition, then we picked up, we took the nest, we cut it in half, we fixed it in the nest and then we inserted a wire mesh in between. So that half the nest was on this side of the mesh and the other half was on the other side of the mesh. Half the egg larvae pupae are on this side, half the egg larvae pupae are on that side. Now we reintroduce the wasp one by one. We took each wasp, tossed a coin, heads you go to the left side, tails you go to the right side. Next wasp, heads you go to the left side, tails you go to the right side. And finally, the same thing for the queen. We took the queen and we said, heads go to the left, tails you go to the right. So at the end of this procedure, we had two subsets of the colony with queen on one side, no queen on the other side, and the workers randomly distributed between the left and the right side. And we had now this situation. On day two, now we studied both sides. We studied the workers on the side where the queen was. We studied the workers on the queenless side. Now, on day three, the equivalent of returning the queen, what we did, was we took the queen from wherever she was and moved her to the opposite side. We didn't touch the workers. Only the queen moved from one side to the other side and we repeated all the observations on day three. Now, we had a certain set of predictions based on this experiment design. Our predictions were as follows. If the queen pheromone is a volatile substance, then wherever the queen is, it will go through the mesh and workers on both sides of the mesh will know that we have a queen because I can smell her. So they will behave as if they have a queen. However, if the queen pheromone is a non-volatile substance and the workers need to come in physical contact with it to recognize that there is a queen, then the workers on the queenless side will think we have lost our queen. And then they will behave as if they don't have a queen. And we know what they will do if they don't have a queen. One worker will become hyper aggressive and become the next queen. So at least they'll become hyper aggressive. Now, if we move the queen from one side to the other side, the hyper aggressive worker should now stop being aggressive because the queen has come back. So these were our predictions. Now, 
this has turned out to be an extremely interesting and useful experimental design. It's tedious to do. It's tedious for us. It's tedious for the wasps, as you can imagine. But it's an extremely uh, useful experimental design. We have used this particular design again and again to answer many different questions. And I will have at least one more uh, question where I will, I will come back to this uh, design. Now, therefore, we have done this experiment many, many times. When this slide was made, we had already done this experiment 24 times. And in all 24 cases, prediction two was obtained, meaning that the workers on the queenless side behaved as if they didn't have a queen. And that means they had a hyper-aggressive potential queen. And once we moved the queen to that side, that potential queen stopped being aggressive. But now the other queenless side had a hyper-aggressive worker. That was our prediction. And that was beautifully borne out. I'll show you what the data would look like. So here is day one. Now I'm plotting the queen and the potential queen one. That is the first the one individual who became hyper-aggressive on day two when the queen was on, on the left side, let us say. And PQ2 is the individual who became hyper-aggressive on day three on the other side. Now, of course, these identifications are post facto. Beforehand, we didn't know anything. We plot the data after doing the whole experiment. So we call this queen, PQ1, PQ2, no aggression in the presence of the queen. Now, the moment you remove the queen, this individual who has no queen on her side became hyper aggressive. And you can see what for how much she has increased her aggression. Now, when you move the queen to her side, she loses her aggression. And a different individual who showed no aggression on day two became hyper aggressive. And that is why we think that the queen pheromone is non-volatile. It's a kind of contact pheromone. And that is what the queen uses to suppress worker reproduction. And therefore, she doesn't have to run around and bite anybody. So in Robolidia marginata, we, we think that the queen appears to use non-volatile pheromones to inhibit worker reproduction. And that sort of explains why she doesn't have to run around and bite everybody else, why she is not a hyper-aggressive individual throughout her career. This raised the question. You remove the queen, one individual, only one individual becomes hyperaggressive and she becomes the next queen. And everybody said, who is this individual? Everybody in humans, in humans are very interested in knowing who is the next leader. If something happens to the present leader, who is the next person in charge? Who will be the next director of CCMB? Everybody would want to know. So everybody asks, the people ask us this question and we wondered, can we predict the identity of the potential queen even before we remove the queen? Because then that will tell us how it is decided. This is an interesting story. This is a question we've been asking again and again and again. And till today, we don't have a satisfactory answer. It appears that we cannot easily identify the queen, at least as of today. We did many experiments. In fact, at one point, most of the time, I used to tell my audience that I don't think I can predict who the queen is. But this question came back again and again to me. And at some point, I said, let's do something serious about this. We must take this question seriously, and we must try to do something about this. And when a professor decides to do something, what it means is the next PhD student has to answer the question. So as new PhD student came to my lab, I told her that your job is to predict the identity of the potential queen without removing the queen. If you do that, you will get a PhD. Now, she being very naive, said, sure, I will do that. And she spent five years, did many experiments, made many discoveries, published many papers. But at the end, she threw up her hands and said, but I cannot identify, I cannot predict the potential queen before removing the queen. So she failed, but we gave her a PhD because she produced lots of interesting results. To give you just one example of the kinds of things she showed, she showed that the potential queen and the workers cannot be distinguished. They're identical. The potential queen is more like a worker than like a queen, but you can see here, these are the potential queens, these are the workers. So they're all mixed up. There is no way to tell them apart. So we cannot predict the identity of the potential queen in the presence of the queen. The potential queen is not unique by any criterion in her dominance rank, in her other behavior, or in her ovarian rank. There is a small chance that my most recent student may have succeeded to some extent in predicting this by doing some very sophisticated multi-layer network analysis. Those results are still in progress, so I won't uh, talk about them and I won't claim that we can identify, but 
there is a small chance that in the future we will be able to predict who the person is. But really, as of today, I would say we cannot predict the person. Now, the next student who came to my lab said, okay, we don't know who the person is, but do the wasps themselves know who their next queen is? Interesting question. First sight, we thought, and many people told us, that this is not an answerable question. This is not really a scientific question. How can you tell what the wasps know and don't know? Can you really know the mind of a wasp? And this student was persistent. She said, no, there must be a way to find out. So we spent a lot of time doing experiments, designing experiments really first, and trying to see whether we can come up with an experimental design, which at least we think will help us answer this question. Do the wasps know who their next queen is? So to frame this question slightly more scientifically, the question we asked is, is it possible that there is a hair designate, even though we cannot identify it? Do the other wasps know who this hair designate is? That's the question we're asking. And it turns out that there is a way to answer this question. I must confess that we tried various experimental designs and we found flaws in our designs and we threw them away. And, but finally, I think we hit upon a design which will actually allow us to answer this question. And this is where, again, we use the design where we put a wire mesh in between and had wasps on either side. Now, the way we did this experiment is the philosophy of the experiment is somewhat different. We said, let us make a postulate that there is a heredity. Let us postulate that everybody except us knows who the hair designate is. If these postulates are correct, then we can predict how the wash should behave in response to our experimental manipulation. And if they behave the way we think they should behave, then our postulates are probably correct. But if they behave differently, then our postulates are wrong. So we're trying to test our postulate. So our postulates are, yes, there is a hair designate, all the wasps know who she is, we don't know who she is. So what is our prediction of how they should behave? What is our experiment? Our experiment, again, is to split a colony in half, queen and half the workers on one side, without queen, the other half workers on the other side. So let me show you this schematically. So here, this is the one half with the queen and some of the workers. Here, there are no queen, just workers. Now, it could happen by chance alone, that there is a hair designate because we have postulated there is a hair designate is sitting here on the opposite side of the queen. If this happens, then actually there's no problem because we know that these workers here on the right side of this picture think they don't have a queen. The hair designate should become a potential queen as we know. So she should become hyper -aggressive. She should become a potential queen. However, if she is the hair designate for the whole colony, then she should not just be acceptable to this side, but she must also be acceptable to the boss on the other side. So what do we do to test whether she's acceptable to the boss on the other side is we exchange. We move the queen from left to right and the potential queen from right to left. We do this and we ask, is this potential queen acceptable to these workers? And we move her back. There should be no problem. She should be accepted as a queen to both sides, in which case we say, yes, she is the potential queen and everybody knows that. But as you can imagine that by chance alone, in half the experiment, the unfortunate hair designate may be sitting next to the queen, not here. And so she cannot become hyper aggressive because the queen is right here. So amongst these workers, one of the best individuals will become hyper aggressive, but she is not the hair designate for the whole colony because that's our postulate. So this one we'll call her now here. Now this hyper aggressive individual should be challenged by the true hair designate. So now we bring her face to face with the hair designate and we ask what happens. So now we expected that all help should break loose. Hair designate should say, I am the hair designate. I am the next queen. This one should say, no, no, I am already the next queen. And there should be a fight. And in fact, this one should lose and the true hair designate should win. Even more interestingly, that's not the end of the story. The acid test for the hair designate is that she should not only be acceptable to the boss here, but she should also have to be accepted to the boss on the other side who just one day earlier, or in fact, in this case, a few hours earlier, had a different potential queen. So we bring her back here and we ask whether she will be acceptable. Okay, that's the experiment. So what is the prediction? Our prediction is that the first individual who becomes hyper the potential queen, should be unacceptable to the opposite side in about 
half the experiments and a second one should emerge but the second one should be accepted on both sides and there should be a ne- never be a third contender to the throne that's our summary prediction now this is even more tedious experiment to do but since this student had invested everything in this idea she spent a lot of time i think almost two years doing these experiments she managed to do them eight times and she found that in three of the eight experiments the first individual to emerge was successful on both sides so this corresponds to the situation where the parent is again on the opposite side but in five of the remaining experiments the first one was not successful the second one emerged and she was successful on both sides in other words both our predictions were upheld and we think in fact therefore our postulates are correct we think both are correct but that there is but i want to say that the most interesting thing about this result is not in the statistics not in the data but in a simple observation what we found most remarkable is that the second one potential queen was never challenged we brought face to face with pq1 there was no challenge no challenge here there was no challenge on the other side she did not receive a single of act of aggression either by the potential queen or by any of the workers either when she emerged or when she was moved to the opposite side and that is what gives us confidence that the hair designate was obviously known and acceptable to all the boss in the colony so this was a moment of great triumph for us great happiness because everybody used to ask me do you know who the potential queen is and i would always say no but now i could say yes i don't know but i know that the wasps know and in fact i'm i was quite surprised when they actually allowed us to write a paper in biology letters with the title we know that the wasps know and we call this cryptic successors to the queen in ropalidium marginata so even though we don't know they seem to know who it is so there is a hair designate even though we cannot identify her with the wasp seem to know who she is now people ask me this seems such a, such a peaceful such a well organized society there is no conflict there is no problem even the they know who the next queen is even in terms of becoming next queen there is no quarrel if there is so much peace and order and cooperation is there no conflict so we were very interested in knowing whether there is conflict in fact to confess we were itching to see a fight we wanted to actually see real fights and we wanted to know how they manage without conflict in fact it turns out that there is conflict so to see whether there is conflict we ask how do they treat wasps from colonies of other other colonies but the same species this we did a very different experiment we said when the members were brought i won't go to the details here i'll just give you the answer in the interest of time when the members of one colony were introduced into the cage of another colony the young alien workers from the foreign colony were freely allowed in the colony just come no problem join our colony but the older workers they were allowed to live in the cage but not come to the colony you can stay in that corner but don't come anywhere near my desk and the queen of the foreign colony was attacked and torn to pieces so you can see that they had a very the resident showed a very nuanced differential treatment to intruders yes there is conflict they can be aggressive but they are not blindly aggressive in the intruders we also asked what happens to these young workers who are welcomed and we followed the fate of these individuals and we found to our great surprise that the young alien workers who are accepted into foreign colonies they become completely integrated into their foster colonies and become normal workers and may even become future queens of that colony they seem to forget that they are alien and the residents seem to forget that they they get completely mixed up the probability of foreign worker becoming queen is directly proportional to the number of foreign workers so there is no bias against these aliens coming into the colony so i want to come back and ask i've given you a sample of a few can we really understand an insect society i said i said the answer you you should give the answer but i want to spend the last 5 minutes on why should we care why should we worry about this people study insect societies for a variety of reasons many of those reasons are very practical insect societies have been used in many ways they are used in pharmacology they are used in drug testing they are uh, their behavior is extremely interesting people have learned from the behavior of the social insects how humans should behave or how we should behave in fact people have developed algorithms from the behavior of wasps there is a whole sub discipline called ant colony optimization people write 
derived computer algorithms. People use this in telecommunication. The lessons learned from how communication happens in ants, bees, and wasps. They are used also for under wasps have a great propensity to make war with outsiders and equally great propensity to maintain peace. So we saw there's a lot of peace inside with insiders and there's a lot of war with outsiders, right? Foreign queen was killed. From an evolutionary point of view, war with outsiders is actually easy to understand. How they maintain so much peace inside is in fact really the mystery. But war with outsiders is useless unless you can have peace inside. If you're having a war outside and war inside, it's of no use. So we think that it is this dual strategy, the ability to try to find balance between conflict and cooperation, conflict with outsiders, cooperation inside. That is what accounts for the great success of insect society. By the way, insect society is extremely successful. Ecologically, evolutionary, they are amongst the most successful species on earth. And in fact, we often call them super organisms. And that is why I think they are so successful. But coming back to why should we care, if you reflect on this, what I've said on this slide, they're not very different from us. We humans are really very similar. And I'll <coughs> give you a final quotation from, <coughs> excuse me, from another philosopher which I'm very fond of. Voltaire said, it is lamentable to be a good patriot. It is lamentable that to be a good patriot, one must become the enemy of the rest of mankind. How else can you be a patriot? You have to hate others. And that seems to be very similar. I certainly do not think that we should imitate animal societies or insect societies or anything in nature blindly. But I do think that they can hold a mirror to us and offer us a means to reflect on our own society and learn about ourselves. That's why when people ask me, why do you study insect societies? I, my answer is, for the same reason that an anthropologist studies other human societies. Why do we study the other human societies? Because they help us to understand ourselves. And that's really my, my motivation for studying, uh, doing these kinds of experiments. But I must end by saying that this work was done in a very different way. Lots of students, lots of ideas, lots of experiments, very little money, very little sophistication, very little instrumentation, but a large number of very passionate students. And I want to end by paying tribute to these very large number of students who are as, who are as passionate about watching these wasps as I am. We start by watching them with no question in mind and let the wasps raise questions in our mind. And we hope that we have answered some of these questions. Our only proof is that if there are other members of the homo sapiens species who agree with us, then maybe we have answered this question. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed giving this talk. I hope you've enjoyed listening it. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, sir, for a very, very delightful talk, uh, for sharing insights into uh, the lives of social insects from several decades of your uh, work on them, or of your group as well, um, and also shining light on the process of doing uh, science in the uh, process. We have uh, several questions coming in. Uh, I'll ask them one by one. Uh, so there's a question from uh, Rajan, and he asks, what happens in the situation when the previous queen is removed and reintroduced after the potential queen becomes the actual queen? I love these questions because it allows me to tell you about other experiments for which I didn't have the time to tell you during, during the talk. Yes. So this is a frequently asked question. What happens if you bring these together? The answer really is it depends on how much time you give for the new queen to establish herself. So we have shown that in the early stages, the old queen wins and the new queen just gives up. Then there is an intermediate stage in time where they both believe that they are the true queen and they fight. But if you wait a little longer, then that is the most interesting. Even the old queen believes that she is no longer the best queen and the new one takes over. So we actually have three time zones. There is what we call a pre-conflict zone where both the old and the queen new agree that the old queen is the correct one. Then there's a conflict zone where they both think they should be there and they fight, they can fight them to death. But then there's a post-conflict zone where they both agree that the new queen is the correct one and the old one voluntarily gives up. In the first phase, the new one voluntarily gives up. In the third one, the old one voluntarily gives up. In the middle phase, they fight. Uh, there's another question from Siddharth. He asks, could there be an epigenetic marker for uh, identifying the potential queen? Very likely very likely and we will 
we will have to get to that level what is clearly known is the making of a queen or a worker is largely epigenetic because the genome is the same you give me an egg and i will give you a queen or a worker whichever you want so it has to be epigenetic but the process is very interesting not only is it epigenetic but it is very much environment and we know that it is driven by nutrition the kind of nutrition that the young larva gets in a particular se- developmentally sensitive window that triggers gene expression and epigenetic changes so almost certainly there would be an epigenetic marker but we have to reach a stage where we try to understand what that is uh there's a question from uh, manish johri and this comes from uh, the youtube live streaming uh he asks is the social organization the highest form of evolution uh can you imagine the next step be, uh, beyond social organization if yes what would it be in evolution there is no such thing as highest form evolution works here and now if the environment changes then a social species can become solitary because it's no longer profitable to be social if the environment changes in the opposite direction social species can become solitary species so in evolution there is no unified direction it depends on how the environment is so there is nothing which is more evolved or less evolved it depends on the environment there's a there's a question from uh, professor tirumalai he asks how do the wasps tell age yeah. okay so we have first we have evidence that they can tell age because what we find is that the way in which the wasp decide who will do what work is based on their age but it is not based on their absolute age it is based on their relative age so if i am the oldest member of the colony or amongst the oldest individuals i do certain things if i am middle aged i do this if i am youngest i do this so we all of this we have established the question is how do they know now if they were using absolute age we would have gone in a different direction we would have said there is some biochemical marker which somehow but now they are telling relative age what does relative age mean it means my age relative to you that means i should not just know my age but i should also know your age which means i have to interact with you so there must be a behavioral component to the mechanism of it so we actually studied this and we built a model saying that if you very simple the simplest model is if there are just two markers two molecules which we called simply called an activator and inhibitor so i have an activator molecule which keeps on increasing as i grow older and older but when i interact with you i receive another molecule from you which acts as an inhibitor to my activator and if you have this interaction with inhibitor and activator then we can we showed that actually they can tell each other's age and they can sort themselves according to their relative ages so we built a model to do this and in other species people are actually now trying to identify these molecules we haven't done that but we have done the behavior part we have a model and the predictions of the model we have tested using behavior experiments another related question uh, related to age itself uh, so harish asks uh, is it possible that age matters and i think he means in determining the potential uh, the next queen and uh, what if among the workers the the most hyperactive one is always the one who is uh, who has the highest age okay so the way we did this was as i said earlier we tried to do various things and we could not find anything unique about the potential but somewhat more recently one of my students did a massive experiment where he had a data set of one i think 100 potential queens so very large data set and then we were able to do much more powerful statistics and we tried to we put in many many possible predictors of the potential queen into the model well to be more precise predictors of the position of the potential queen in the queue there's not just one potential queen there are several so there's a queue and we can tell which where you are in the queue and to make the long story short we found nothing that was statistically good except age age was the only significant predictor of saying where an individual is in the queue but so we said then is it as simple as that the queen dies the next oldest individual becomes the queen she dies the next oldest individual is it as simple as that we tested this answer is no and we tested this in a very simple way what we did was we followed a colony till we knew the ages of all the individuals so we know everybody's age 
And therefore, we write down in our notebook who the next queen should be. We remove this queen, who should be PQ1, remove her, who should be PQ2, PQ3, PQ4, PQ5. We write it down because we know the ages. Then we go and do the experiment and we ask, do the wasps follow this rule or do they jump the queue? And we found that they very often jump the queue. So in other words, age is a statistically significant predictor, but not a perfect predictor. It's a statistically variable, but not a perfect predictor, because they often jump the queue, which means there is something more than age. Now, one way to say this verbally is that the potential queen seems to be drawn from among the older individuals, but which among them is not strictly according to age. So there are still other factors that we need to understand, but age is an important factor. Um, uh, uh, the director would like to ask you a question. Could we please unmute him? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bharti. I didn't know how to type a question, so <laughs> that I raised my hand. <laughs> I was touching it. So, uh, since you said, I mean, for, it is such a fascinating uh, uh, talk here, it's wonderful. So, uh, and I think everybody is excited now. They will go and look around in sex, uh, I'm sure. So uh, uh, I just want to know, uh, since you think uh, epigenetic is a player in this process, do we know if they, uh, what kind of epigenetic mechanism exists? Because there are insects where they have very strong DNA methylation setup and some like flies are very poor or uh, non-existent kind. So in this, uh, we know, uh, 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 which will also mean whether the genome has been sequenced and some it has been analyzed. In, in the wasp, we don't know. But uh, people are working with honeybees and ants. They are doing a lot of work in this in this area. So no, I was talking about the species you are working on. Uh, there are other wasp, other things uh, there we know about this species. We don't know. Yeah, but for ants and honeybees, there's a lot of yes, work yes, on yes. epigenetic yeah. uh, determining who the queen would be. At. Okay, okay. So the, the, which means this genome is not sequenced yet to. to this species is not sequenced, but of course, honeybee and many ant genomes have yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, could we take a few more questions, uh, Professor Gadakar? Would you oh, be yes, okay? With I, am, I am not going anywhere. <laughs> I have to stay in my <laughs> office here, so I can take any number of questions. I have no problem. <laughs> cool. Uh, Meghna Krishnadas has a, a question. Are there known or possible drivers of differences in the nutrition an individual gets? In other words, uh, is individual probability of obtaining high or low nutrition driven by a stochastic or a deterministic process? This is a very interesting question and we really don't understand fully. What we have found, you see, sometimes when you find new things, they are even more surprising than what you started with. So we are in that stage. We found that nutrition is an important thing. So the first thing we did was we measured the rate of, of food intake. And we showed many years ago that even as, see in honeybees, there are, there are quality of food is different. The larvae which are to be made into queens are given what is called royal jelly, which is a different kind of food, very rich in sugars. Workers are not given royal jelly, they are given ordinary food, much less in sugar. And so there's a qualitative difference in the diet. Now in our wasps, there is no qualitative difference. But could there be a quantitative difference? And so many years ago, we studied this. We looked at natural variation in food intake because some wasps are able to forage and get a lot of food. Others are not able to get a lot of food. And we measured rates, how often the larvae were fed in some colonies, in other colonies. And we showed that there is a strong effect of this larval nutrition well-fed larvae are more likely to become future queens when a vacancy arises and poorly fed larvae are less likely to become future queens. Okay. So that's the first thing we found. The second thing found even more interesting is that when we give unlimited food to the adults, they all don't seem to eat enough as the well, same amount. They eat very differently and those who eat more are more likely to become future queens. Those who eat less are less likely to become future queens. So we asked, but why don't they all eat more? Even though everybody should want to become a queen. And then we found something very surprising. We found a correlation between larval nutrition and adult hunger. If you are a well-fed larva, you feel more hungry than an adult, you eat more and you become a 
more likely to be queen if you are a poorly fed larva you feel less, seem to feel less hungry and you are less chance of becoming a future queen so it's very mysterious but we went one step in another see you go in whichever step you, direction you can go you go so we went another direction and we said what if we actually change the nutrition ourselves so most recently my students what they have done is they have actually hand fed the wasps so in one set of colonies you keep food for them take whatever you want unlimited food we give them as much as they want in another colony in addition to giving them unlimited food my student actually force feed the wasp she takes a little bit of food in the forceps and sits in front of the wasp and said here here take some food and she does this for all the wasps and then they eat much more and they are more likely to become queens but when you give them on their own they don't take so it is obviously much more complicated than that it is not just the availability of food but there is there are physiological process processes of becoming hungry and wanting to eat so this is a much bigger question but clearly the role of nutrition is very important we know that larval nutrition matters adult nutrition matters there's a correlation between larval nutrition and adult hunger and adult nutrition and egg lay all these correlations we know now we want to understand the physiological mechanism by which this happens uh, there's a question from siddharth uh, is there any advantage to be a queen in the colony <laughs> depends on what you mean by advantage now from an evolutionary point of view in evolution everything depends on so called fitness so the queen has very high fitness because she produces a large number of offspring now the workers in the old definition of fitness they have zero fitness because they don't produce any offspring but we know from the theory of kin selection they also get indirect fitness because the individuals for whom they are working uh, they share genes with those individuals so there is something called direct fitness there is something called indirect fitness now the sum of these two is the total fitness which we call inclusive fitness now we have to calculate what that inclusive fitness is by and large the inclusive fitness of the queen is greater than that of the workers so there would be a drive for every individual to try to become the queen and becoming a worker seems to be the next best option but then you might ask but why do they want to do that why can't they go off and live on their own but the trouble is the environment is so hard that an individual if she is alone she gets zero so if she is a very strong individual she can become the queen of the colony if she is a weak individual she can become a worker in a colony but don't want to be alone because environment is very harsh because the environment is very harsh individuals accept sort of second price to become a worker rather than the first price so that depends on on you but we have also shown that a very small number of wasps are so strong whatever that strong means that they can go off on their own and start their own nest solitarily and attract others to join them and become social Uh, so uh, devi see uh, devi prasad v has a question uh, there are two questions uh, is the potential queen a sitter or a fighter or a forager before it becomes a queen and related to that if uh, if the queen if the pheromone is not uh, volatile one would expect the queen to go around and touch all the workers but she is a sitter uh, so how is the pheromone carried around excellent so first question where does the potential queen come from so one of my students again studied this in a large number of colonies and you know the way you do this you don't know who the person in the beginning you do all of this you classify them sitter fighter forager then you go and remove the queen then you identify the potential queen then you go back to your data and ask was she a sitter or a fighter or a forager and he showed that the potential queen has equal chance of being a sitter or a fighter but not a forager so foragers seem to be too old to become future queens but they can come equally from the sitter as from the fighters strategy that's the first answer to the first question the second question is about the non volatile pheromone yes so this is something we wondered so we said how do the workers perceive the non volatile pheromone of the queen so this was actually a major research project we did so our first hypothesis was through physical contact so we said workers have to touch the queen and receive that pheromone so we said how to test whether this is in fact what they do and the way we Design an experiment to test this is the following. We said we remove the queen, and we find out how long it takes for the potential queen to realize that the queen is gone and become hyper aggressive. 
so this is the time where she is no longer receiving the varam right then we ask but when the queen is there she is not becoming hyper aggressive that must she that means she must be touching the queen more often than that so let us say it takes in fact we have shown that it takes 30 minutes for a potential queen to realize that there is no queen so when the queen is there she is feel that the queen is there that means she must be touching the queen more than once in 30 minutes so we said let us measure the rate at which there is physical interaction between the queen and the workers and we found no because the queen is a sitter she is sitting somewhere there is very little interaction so it could not be through physical contact <laughs> what then we said maybe every work the potential queen doesn't have to go and touch the queen she may have a chamcha who touches the queen and then gives the passes it on to her so there may be a relay there may be some individuals who are close to the queen like in nani bi and they may be then passing it on to others so we looked at all possible interactions we constructed a huge matrix of interactions and we calculated all possible routes by which the pheromone can go from queen to a to b to c to finally the potential queen all the possible routes and we calculated which is the shortest possible route even the shortest possible route was much more than 30 minutes so direct physical contact is not working relay doesn't work so what is there and this is where i this gives me a chance to say this which i didn't say earlier when i give these talks sometimes people get the impression you have a question and you do an experiment you have an answer that gives you the next question then you know what experiment to do real life is not like that very often we just stumped we don't know what we have a question but we don't know what to do what what do you do how do you answer this it is never it's not always so obvious this is one of those cases where we were just stumped we didn't know what to do next direct interaction doesn't work relay doesn't work she is it is non volatile and she is a sitter how do you solve this problem whenever we are stumped you know what we do we said let's watch the boss for fun we just go and watch the boss and in this particular case what happened was we had a young new student in fact i think he was an intern who watched who didn't know any of these and he discovered something which we had overlooked because we see the boss every day he said the queen is moving in some funny way and we said what is the funny way she seemed to be dragging her abdomen as she walks on the nest so we went and looked at it and we said yes that seems to be true so we had the hypothesis that the queen is actually rubbing applying the pheromone to the surface of the paper nest and the workers are getting it from there so we asked so he then he and other students did a very detailed study of where all does the queen rub her first they showed that only the queen rubs her abdomen on the nest workers do not rub their abdomen then they showed that the queen is actually rubbing her abdomen all over the nest not just in one place so she may not be interacting with the wasp but she is rubbing her abdomen all over the nest also now we have further proof of that because we know that this pheromone is produced in the divorce gland which opens through a duct on the underside of the abdomen so it actually flows out through that and she is actually rubbing the nest and we have proved this by taking the pheromone from the queen and we rub it on the nest and it works so we do experiments where we take out the queen we have a hyper aggressive potential queen if you return the queen she will drop her aggression but in returning is a returning the queen we take out the pheromone from the queen and we rub it to the nest and the potential queen stops being aggressive so we have very good proof that the pheromone is applied by the queen to the nest surface from where the workers get it. um my co moderator gopi krishnan has a question he okay. asked uh, how does the proportion of individuals from each caste uh, how is it regulated in a colony we don't know we have no idea it's it's very complicated actually because first of all the first level of complication is the following i said sitters fighters for ages when was become adults when they eclose from the pupa initially all of them are sitters because they don't do very much in the beginning so we have to distinguish those from real sitters who are a little bit older we find a lot of variation we have no idea how these are regulated uh, i can only begin to guess if there are a lot of larvae hungry larvae you need a lot of foragers if the queen is weak then aggression may be more important in the colony at that time 
or if you have a large colony, everything is going very well. There seems to be a reasonable amount of food. The queen is very strong and stable, so there's not likely to be any problem. There are no predators, etc. That may be the time when you put a lot of individuals as reserves to be used in an emergency. So these are, I'm just hand waving and making guesswork. Actually, we don't know. Thanks for answering that, sir. Uh, there's a comment and uh, another question. Uh, the comment from uh, Arvind Kumar is, uh, the Royal Jelly has HDAC inhibitors like phenylbutyrate, uh, and uh, consuming this can change the gene expression profile. And I think this is with reference to how nutrition might influence uh, the fate of uh, individual. And uh, the question, uh, the other question from uh, TV is, uh, do wasp colonies have infestations from say mites or bacteria and might this influence their fitness and hence who becomes the queen? First question, yes, this is being very intensively studied in honeybees. Actually, honeybees are the only species that have a royal jelly. Even ants don't have royal jelly. Termites don't have royal jelly. Wasps don't have royal jelly. There, it's simply more the quantity of nutrition than quality. Honeybee is a very clear difference in royal jelly. And this is being studied very extensively. And in fact, people can take out the royal jelly, feed it to young larvae and make them queens or not feed it and make them workers. So this is being, and also the physiology of this is being studied in great detail. It turns out that actually the mystery of the royal jelly is that it's extremely rich in sugars. It's a very, very high sugar diet that the larva needs during this very, very small, very sensitive window of time. If you give it to her after that, it doesn't work. If you give it before, it doesn't work. So that is being studied. But that happens only in honeybees. In ants and termites and wasps, it's quantity of nutrition. And we understand much less here how the quantity of nutrition actually plays out this role of distinguishing between and workers. So we understand much less with uh, ants and with, with wasps. Now, in terms of uh, mites, etc., yes. Now, uh, of course, in honeybees, there are very famous varroa mite and so on. So we haven't seen mites, but we have seen uh, all kinds of parasites. There are, uh, it, there are flies which actually hover over the nest and the flies keep the, their eggs in their body, the eggs hatch in their body, and they literally airdrop young larvae onto the nest. And these larvae then crawl and get into the larvae of our wasps and they grow inside them. So that's how they parasitize the nest. There are also ichneumonid wasps, which have these very, very long and thin ovipositors. So they come very quickly and inject an egg into the larva of Roponidia and fly away before the adults get them. And they're very long ovipositors. So there are all kinds of parasites. There are, as I said, flies, there are wasps, there are uh, moths, all of these. Now, do they affect the fitness? I bet they affect, but we have not, we have not measured them. In fact, very soon we are likely to start a new project trying to understand the microbiome of these wasps. And through that project, we might be able to get to this question. So the Answer of course, the expectation of course it will affect the fitness, but then the real question is how common is it in nature? Does it play a role? Do these parasites play a role in the population dynamics of the host species? That is something we have not studied, but it should be studied. <clears throat> I think we'll close the question answer session with that, sir. Thanks so much for the fascinating talk and patiently answering all of these questions. And also to all the participants for uh, asking such very interesting uh, questions. Uh, over, Absolutely. Over to you, Somdatta.